Welcome everyone to The Real News Network. My name is Maximilian Alvarez. I'm the editor-in-chief here at The Real News, and it's so great to have you all with us. Today is Saturday, March 5th, and the world continues to watch in horror as the full-scale Russian military invasion wreaks havoc on Ukraine and its people and pushes the world closer to the ever-approaching brink of global catastrophe. Since this invasion began on February 24th, Nearly 1.3 million people have fled the fighting in Ukraine, and at least 351 civilians have been killed, according to the United Nations. According to the latest updates from the news agency Reuters, quote, Russian forces seized the Zaporizhka nuclear power plant in eastern Ukraine, the largest nuclear power plant in Europe, after a building at the complex was set ablaze during intense fighting with Ukraine defenders, the U.S. Embassy in Ukraine called the Russian assault on the Zaporizhka plant a war crime. The European Union, the United States, Britain, and others have hit Russia with a wide range of sanctions after its invasion of Ukraine. The sanctions span various industries and include financial, energy, export, and travel bans. Russia's large banks are deeply integrated into the global financial system, and the country is one of the world's biggest energy producers, meaning sanctions could disrupt economies around the world, end quote. In his first extended remarks about the war since the invasion began, Russian President Vladimir Putin said today, quote, these sanctions that are being imposed are like the declaration of war, end quote. Then, in a deeply ominous and chilling statement about the response to the invasion by Ukrainian and world leaders, Putin went on to say, quote, The current leadership needs to understand that if they continue doing what they are doing, they risk the future of Ukrainian statehood, end quote. In today's interview, we're going to be taking a look at the media side of war and at the ways our mediated connections to war and to each other can limit how we think and act but also how we can use the tools available to us, from social media to independent news, to think more clearly and act more bravely and lovingly. And I couldn't be more honored to be joined today by my guest, who is very much dedicated to that struggle and has been for quite some time. Abby Martin is an American journalist, show presenter, activist, and artist. She helped found the citizen journalism website Media Roots, she is the host of the invaluable investigative documentary and interview series, The Empire Files, and she has been involved in numerous film projects, including producing the recent feature documentary, Gaza Fights for Freedom, and she is currently producing another feature entitled Earth's Greatest Enemy. Abby, thank you so much for joining me today. It's a great honor to be talking to you. Thanks for having me. Well... It's almost like where do we start right because <laughs> um you know there, there there's so much to talk about and so much invaluable experience that i know that um viewers and listeners um would would love to hear you speak on but i suppose we should start with kind of the most recent news um just that happened just this week um for viewers and listeners who may not have seen um news broke uh, a couple days ago that rt america announced that it would cease productions and would lay off most of its staff now for viewers and listeners rt america uh, was a u.s-based news channel headquartered in washington dc it was owned by tv novosti uh operated by production company tnr productions and it was part of the RT Network, a global multilingual television news network that is funded by the Russian government. And RT America has hosted the likes of critical voices, including Chris Hedges, Lee Camp, Anders Lee, and of course, Abby Martin. And before viewers and listeners jump down our throats and, and, and you know shout about this, we want to kind of take a measured look at this. Because this isn't just RT America. Um, Radio Sputnik has also been taken off a lot of podcast platforms, and they host shows like By Any Means Necessary, um, hosted by Jacqueline Lukman and Sean Blackman, a show that I've been on many times to talk about worker issues, labor struggles, strikes, so on and so forth. And uh, of course, um, Russia is not the only country that has um, funded news agencies around the world. The U.S. has many. So with that, all those caveats in mind, um, Abby, I wanted to just 
get your thoughts and impressions on the news of the shuttering of RT America and um, I guess what you think this may portend not just for media that has any ties whatsoever to the Russian state, but any uh, media that in fact um, doesn't toe the national line or or it takes critical stances that aren't, uh, you know, well received in the fog of war. What are your thoughts? What are your impressions? Yeah, I mean, you bring up really salient points that I think need to be explored first and foremost. The first one is we need to be honest and not hypocritical when we're looking at the landscape of media that we all need to navigate as responsible, critical thinkers today. Um, Of course, we all know the problems with corporate media. Of course, I don't need to tell viewers of Real News Network why that's problematic. And that's why you see foreign funded networks like Russia Today cynically, let's be honest about this, I mean, cynically filling that void, that huge void left by the corporate media apparatus, the void of, you know, the lack of real reporting, substantive coverage of issues like third party candidates occupy Wall Street. And in fact, that is what this is really about. This is about the suppression um, of and, and purging of all dissident voices in the landscape of alternative media. I mean, the U.S. establishment has been clamoring for years to do this, to purge everyone that doesn't kind of toe the line of what the U.S. foreign policy, policy establishment wants. And we saw this come to a head with the DNI report. Um, when Trump won the election, of course, there was a deliberate effort to absolve the political establishment's failures or accountability or reckoning of how we got to this place. And instead, they just wanted to blame Putin and not only blame Putin for undermining our you know, alleged democracy, but also Russian media as this huge sinister propaganda effort that really sowed this sinister you know, um, distrust and discontent with American institutions. And that's actually what gave us the rise of Trump. It was Russian media, um, these you know, $10,000 or whatever, very menial amount of Facebook ads that you know, did this and that. And really, it's kind of laughable when you look at how much does the U.S really meddle in, um, you know, in foreign policy all around the world? How much does the U.S. undermine sovereignty of countries all around the world? How much has the U.S. really pumped its own propaganda and dominated this kind of cultural hegemony over the rest of the world? The list goes on and on and on. But what they really did was grossly exaggerate the effect and impact of Russian propaganda to deflect what they were doing, how Trump came to be. So this is kind of a long This is basically the culmination of a long, years long um, plan to purge all alternative media, whether it's people, you know, opposing the assassination of General Soleimani and the purging of pro Iran voices on networks like Twitter and Facebook, but really it's the kind of coalescing of big tech Silicon Valley giants working and acquiescing with state government policy. And what's scary about this is there wasn't even legislation that demanded them to do so. This was a kind of a preemptive um, preemptive coordination with the government on behalf of organizations like Google and Facebook. And you saw the fact checking go into account um, where you had people like uh, on the board of Atlantic Council. You know, this is defense contractor funded think tanks that were now tasking themselves with fact checking. Um, So all of this put together brings us to today, which is Russia Today, America, the American Bureau in DC shuttering its doors. I'm assuming as the result of constrictive sanctions that have basically made it untenable and impossible to run the bureau. This is after we see YouTube banning, straight up banning and removing all RT platforms in Europe. I mean, this is a huge swath of territory that now you cannot access the Russian perspective. And then we saw US distribution, of course, cut off Russia media. Um, that includes Comcast and DirecTV, I, I'm pretty sure. And as you mentioned, it's not just, you know, it's not just the cartoonish depiction of a Putin-run propaganda network. I think it's very obvious by its name, Russia Today, that it's Russian state media, that it parrots the bias of Russia, and that it peddles Russian talking points. That's not a shocking declaration. The problem is that we have 
the U.S. corporate media, which basically acts as the arm of the Pentagon whenever we need uh, critical dissent against U.S. foreign policy. These voices kind of uniformly come together. They coalesce and they essentially just echo whatever the foreign policy line is of the U.S. empire and its junior collaborators. And that is a highly sophisticated propaganda model that we that we basically parrot and declare as free press. Um, We herald and cherish the notion of free press in this country, but what does that really mean if we have this ever-constrictive media apparatus that essentially only echoes corporate media talking points? I mean, this is is an apparatus that is controlled by five corporations. Um, It affects more than 90% of everything we see, hear, and read. And for me, as a critical thinker and as someone who really cares about what our government is doing abroad, I feel like... I need to have a wide range of views that I can navigate on my own. And I don't want the infantilizing effect of censorship. I don't want my reality curated for me by big tech giants. I want to be able to pick and choose what the truth is, determine my own reality based on the facts that are available. And that's why this is so offensive. That's why this is such an extreme measure. Because at the same time, you see all these corporate news anchors bemoaning censorship in Russia. And while that may be true, and that is horrible, what Russia is doing to shut down independent media, why are we doing it too? Why are we limiting and actually purging Russian media that, of course, it doesn't just host Russian talking points. This is one of the only networks that actually uplifted marginalized voices, going back to the cynical exploitation and covering the void that's lacking by the corporate media, RT America was an incredible opportunity to highlight voices like Chris Hedges, consistent anti-war voices like myself, Lee Camp. And that was unmatched. That platform that RT America gave us was unmatched. Our viewpoints are not allowed on the corporate media. Dissent against empire is not allowed on the corporate media. And that is why we had to go to places like Russia today in order to have a platform for these very important and crucial perspectives. Um, and so the shuttering of RT, you know, this was, and if I, if I may just say something really quickly about the DNI report, I mean, we saw this firsthand in what the DNI report said. We were told by the intelligence agencies that this 2017 report was supposed to be a conclusive indictment on Russian media. What it was instead was it wasn't about how RT promoted Russia and Putin. It was about that it covered forbidden viewpoints. So, for example, it pointed out my show specifically, Breaking the Set, which was on air for three years, ended two years before the Trump um, administration was elected. It talked about how I fomented radical discontent because I covered issues like third party candidates, that I covered issues like fracking, um, like socialism. I mean, this is what they were really scared of. This is why they wanted to shun RT. And of course, in that huge wave of shunning all alternative media and blaming it for really the discontent, the real, very real grievances that exist, um, they don't want those grievances shown or aired. They want to sanitize our reality and pretend that these viewpoints simply don't exist because then it's easier to to basically control the masses and manufacture consent for whatever they want to do. And Max, I think it's really crucial. I want the Russian perspective as we're heading into this potential standoff, a potential hot war with two nuclear armed powers. I want the Chinese perspective. I want the Iranian perspective. I want the Russian perspective. I'm not a child. This is all this does is constrict the already very severely limited parameters of debate on our airwaves. And I feel like we're not children. We can make up our own minds. Man, I think that's very well and powerfully said. And um, I mean, there's so much there that I want to respond to. And I, but I honestly think that, you know, for viewers and listeners, um, it's a tough situation to be in, right? I mean, we need to kind of accept that as the starting point. There are no pure souls here. There are people who are committed to peace and justice and equality, doing the best with what we've got. You heard Abby mention um, that RT, yes, of course, cynically, for its own political purposes, had a vested interest in platforming voices that were not welcome on US mainstream media. But also think about what that actually means like how how could you 
say that Chris Hedges, you know, or Abby Martin is a is a puppet of the Russian state. Chris Hedges was vilified for speaking out against the the post 9-11 fury of war that that we grew up in. And like that's that should be something that we should, you know, kind of sympathize with. And it should open up that space that that Abby pointed to that if the mainstream media has that sort of stranglehold on the contours of permissible debate in this country. And that limits our capacity to think and act in this world, to know, in fact, about the world that we are in and to to be guided towards certain ends with the limited knowledge that we have, the limited vision that we are given. Um, That is very dangerous. That is how and why you see what we're seeing right now, which very much harkens back to those post 9-11 days you know, Abby, I know that you and I were just a couple of years apart in, in high school and we grew up in, in similar areas. But like, I feel like I didn't quite grasp then. And granted, I was a very conservative person who fully bought into the, the war, you know, Fuhrer after 9-11. Um, but seeing it more as an adult now, it is very scary to recognize how quickly right the day before the russian invasion began we were focused on you know we we're still talking about covid-19 and the like government's uh, opening up a, a restructuring of the cdc guidelines we were talking about trans kids being attacked and and vilified in texas we were talking about important labor struggles around the us and beyond and suddenly it was like a pavlovian bell had been rung everyone stopped dropped everything. This became our primary focus. The media apparatus kind of just went right into full effect. And all, and I, even I felt it in myself, right? I mean, like, and, and, and I was deeply uncomfortable with that because I feel like I'm a critical person. But I, it just immediately, I felt that that sort of ideological conditioning just be activated at a moment's notice. Um, I guess I wanted to to ask before I, I, I move on to to talking about your time at RT. Just um, I guess what you what you feel that says about how much we may have or have not learned from what we saw um, in that sort of propagandistic effort, pro war effort, that sort of cultural mania after nine eleven. Have we come much farther from that uh, now? It's a really good point, and it's a very important comparison because i similarly feel that way max um i i feel like our reptile brain was activated as peace loving people as anti-imperialists as someone who has values that i hold very strongly that guide my principles and my actions i mean i have moral consistency and so of course i'm horrified um, at what Russia did. And, and I think it's a criminal action. And, and, you know, I think that it should be widely condemned. But I think we all need to take a step back and then ask after the horror subsides and through the fog of war, because it's very hard to determine what's going on on the ground right now, is how did we get here? And it is so interesting to think back about nine to nine eleven because that's really what um, it was formative for my political awakening and radicalization. And I think post 9-11 weeks and months and of course years you can argue it never really ended right this mass conditioning it was such a revealing time and how propaganda can really take hold of a society and and essentially guide tens of millions of people who are completely terrified into supporting the hell that this government unleashed on the rest of the world for the last two decades we were a country that was paralyzed with fear we were driven by bloodlust and revenge And since then, the news media further consolidated, further synchronized its messaging. Um, I think Project Censor did this study showing how that 24-hour kind of broadcast um, was really perfected from 9-11. I think we saw like Anna Nicole Smith and then 9-11 was like the next time that it was like 24-7, let's just never stop showing the horror and destruction of these towers, you know, falling and and all of this. And then it just never stopped. It's like, it, there is something to be said about that psychological control of like always having that beaten into your mind. Um, and, you know, since that day, I mean, and it just further consolidated ever since then, where we saw 
let's go back to the Trump administration. I mean, this algorithmic censorship that has further tightened its control over over our airwaves. I mean, backpaging sources like the real news. And now you have this media machinery that basically uniformly acts as one voice, whether it's on Fox News or CNN or whatever, when it comes to U.S. foreign policy and our supposed friends and foes around the world. And you see a similar uniformity, just like you did with the Venezuela regime change efforts. You see a similar uniformity acting um, in reaction to Russia's invasion of Ukraine, where it's the same resolve and hysterical browbeating, hand wringing um, that we saw after 9 11, right? Well, we need to do something about this. What are we going to do about this? Of course, we're the world arbiter of morality and everything holy, even though there was no attack here. Russia didn't do anything to this country, but it's this climate we've fostered that we're the world's empire, that we have the duty and the right uh, to, let's just say, collectively punish tens of millions of people in another country, strangle them, asphyxiate their economy, prevent them from doing anything. The bloodlust, the, the, it's, it's sick, it's sick, it's so disturbing that people are just calling, clamoring for war and escalation. This is a nuclear armed power. Why is this happening? And so what you see is this kind of collective punishment um, to not just Russian oligarchs, but to all of its citizens. I mean, making boycotting Russians compulsory within a matter of days. And then, of course, you see big tech um, acting accordingly as well to, to basically crack down on anything that could be deemed a Russian media affiliate. Anyone who's simply now bringing up the role of NATO and the U.S. government is now deemed a Putin apologist, it really does go back to the days of the demands of leftists who dared to oppose early on the invasion of Iraq and, of course, subsequently, I'm sorry, Afghanistan and subsequently Iraq, the demands to basically denounce Saddam Hussein, uh, to denounce the Taliban. I mean, it, it's sad how little we've learned but it's also very um, instructive of how we can move forward and try to avoid falling into the, into the same disastrous pitfalls that we uh, that we unfortunately did in a post 9/11 world. And I think first and foremost, it's acknowledging the role of our government. How did we get here? And pushing for peace and de-escalation, and that includes abolishing NATO, um, because that's a really strong force that has basically sowed the seeds and set the stage for everything that we're seeing today. Well, and like, you know, that, that I'm, I'm really glad that you brought up the, the sort of algorithmic censorship, because that is another thing that has been keeping me up at night. Um, probably because I'm now the editor in chief of an independent news network, right? <laughs> and we live and die in many ways on these algorithms, both uh, on YouTube, on Facebook, on Twitter. Uh, it's how we get the message out, because as Abby said, we're not on network news, right? We have to hustle to gain visibility and there are a lot of ways that these privately owned tech companies can essentially tweak their algorithms to make us invisible and to make others invisible this is exactly what we saw in the wake of the russia gate um you know uh, hysteria uh, that that abby mentioned before right um again i speaking personally and this was before i was even at the real news but i think that you know, I cover workers' struggles. I lift up workers' voices. I, I, that's that's my beat, I suppose. I try to do other stuff, but it is very, very difficult to find outlets that are willing to give that sort of deep attention to, uh, you know, train operators who had their strike blocked by a court and are deathly afraid to speak out for fear of retaliation from the company. It is incredibly hard to find outlets that will lift up the voices of um, Spanish-speaking workers at uh, a production plant um, for Amy's Kitchen in California, like I did here at The Real News. Point being is that that is the stuff that got shadow banned in the wake of, uh, you know, the, the Russia gate, not just my stuff, but the police accountability report, Eddie Conway's coverage of prisons at rattling the bars. So for folks who are cheering on or not thinking that uh, the, the shuttering of RT America or deplatforming of shows like or platforms like Radio Sputnik, that it's going to stop there. It's not. We've seen in the past that it hasn't stopped there. And um, all of us to circle back to Abby's point about how this 
you know, essentially infantilizes us and limits our ability to think and act and be in the world, that is the cumulative effect. So we should all be very mindful of the waters that we are wading in right now. And, you know, kind of building from that point, like you said, Abby, like there's, there are going to be many op- opportunities for us to bend to that might, to bend to that cultural pressure, that political pressure that can get very vicious very quickly. The racist attacks on you know Muslim people or anyone brown for that matter after 9-11, right? The vicious vilification of people who speak out about the U.S. or NATO's role here. I'm, we're seeing that unfold in real time and we are all going to be tested, I think. And we are all going to have the chance to stand by our principles, our commitment to peace, to justice, to equality, to the sanctity of life on this planet. And that is something that in fact ties very well to your experience at RT America because you, you know, as you said, you hosted a show there for three years and um, quite famously uh, spoke out on that show against the Russian invasion and annexation of Crimea. And I guess I wanted to ask you if you could sort of take us back to that moment um, when you, I guess, probably felt that, that pressure what was going through your mind if you could i guess just tell listeners a bit more about that uh, event and and why you felt the need to to make that stand and and say what you did absolutely i was hosting breaking the set which was an opinion show every day at rt america for three years i was covering war crimes and foreign policy decisions from the u.s government that i had strong opinions and disagreements about And I was never told what to do or say from my bosses. I had 100% editorial freedom to do whatever I wanted. And that stands in very stark contrast to what we're told about RT. You know, there's this cartoonish depiction of RT that we had some sort of morning meeting at a round table where Putin, you know, like 1984 is like on the telescreen being like, this is what you do today. And like that, I mean, it's just, it's just hilarious because as I said before, you can really, pick apart the entire corporate media as well as all the state-funded media, including Voice of America, Radio Free Europe, and basically levy the same criticisms at all of these networks, including FICE, which, by the way, is funded by Saudi Arabia. Um, so, you know, the hypocrisy is is staggering. But let's, let's go back to that day where, you know, Russian troops started to amass at the border um, and started to move into Crimea. Now, being someone who has uh, moral consistency and who was really willing at that point, I was like, look, I am willing to risk my job because I feel strongly about saying something, especially being at a Russian funded network. I felt like um, I was in quite a dilemma because not only did I feel strongly about, you know, being against militarism of any fashion and having, you know, militarily moving into annexed territories was wrong. But I also felt like at Russia Today, I, I felt like the network was becoming an arm of the Russian government for the first time I felt that way. And I wanted to, to distinguish myself as an independent voice that I wasn't going along with the rest of the network's narrative that honestly felt very similar to me of the U.S. media establishment's narrative during the lead up to the invasion of Iraq, where if you'll remember, um, troops were greeted with flowers and candy. And that's what we basically saw um, when when the first troops hit the ground. And that's what I was seeing on RT all around me. And I was like, look, I do not agree with this. I need to distinguish myself. I need to distinguish my voice. And um, I didn't even think anyone would see it, you know, and I went into my boss's office that morning. I wasn't trying to hijack air. I wasn't trying to throw the network under the bus. I went and spoke to my my manager and I was like, look, this is what I feel. If you don't want me to read this statement on air, I'm going to walk out the door. And he was like, go for it. He said, if you feel that strongly about this, then you should do it. And so I said what I said. Um, What was really shocking, though, is what happened after that. Um, overnight, I became an anti-Russian hero. I was broadcast on the front page of all these major newspapers around the world. I was hit up by almost every single corporate media outlet trying to get my story because they were using me for Western propaganda. All of a sudden, I was 
the anti-Russian hero, the dissident at Russian-backed media, the Kremlin operation that that had the audacity to, to stand up against her handler. Um, quickly, as someone who comes from a very critical media lens and someone who basically was a citizen journalist, I immediately understood the role that I was you know, being used for. And so I turned it around really quickly. Every time I would talk to like, let's say NPR, I would remind them that they're funded by Shell and Chevron. <laughs> How does that affect your editorial freedom? You know, do you self-censor? Do you not talk about this and that because of the funding, the very questionable funding that you guys get? Or when I went on Piers Morgan's show and said, look, CNN is as responsible for what is happening, the constant fear-mongering and war-mongering about Russia. So quickly, I didn't serve their goals. And so what happened after that was that I had to be thrown under the bus very quickly and smeared. I was even alleged that I was like a false flag on behalf of Russia to pose like they had editorial freedom at the network, that I was being used by the network and that this was all a setup. Two days later, this is where it gets really fascinating and I'll try to make a long story short. Two days later, a colleague of mine. Going. I'm, I'm, I'm riveted. It's absolutely <laughs> insane. And I think it really says a lot about this entire situation that's unfolding today. Two days later, a colleague of mine who was an anchor who had no political views, she was pretty apolitical. She was just a, a standard, you know, reading the teleprompter anchor. I, I actually was close with her as a friend. Um, and I can I can testify that she was not, you know, didn't have strong political views like me about war or anything like that. Two days after I did what I did, she resigns live on air. I can't work at this Kremlin propaganda outfit, blah, 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 blah. Immediately, she has a whole media tour lined up within an hour of her leaving RT. She was on all of these different stations all night long. She had a big tell-all in the Daily Beast the next day. Basically, what happened, and, and part of her media rounds was calling me a conspiracy theorist, a lunatic, immediately throwing what I did under the bus to legitimize what she did as actually the braver act. She was the real dissident. She was the real hero in the story. And the media lapped it up. She went on Colbert Report. She went everywhere, baby. She was the hero of the story. But what happened behind the scenes is actually very telling because what her entire resignation was, was actually a PSYOP that was stage managed by Bill Crystal's henchmen. Bill Crystal, the famous one of the famous architects of the Iraq war, had a foreign policy think tank called the FPI, the Foreign Policy Initiative in DC. And they basically helped facilitate this entire resignation. They stage managed the whole thing. And they saw what happened to me. They saw the media attention that happened to me. And they saw that I was trying to explain that I was actually given the editorial freedom to criticize Putin and that I wasn't fired like Phil Donahue was on U.S. media for criticizing the Iraq war. And that I actually paved my own freedom at the network. If I could do this at RT, what are other anchors' um, explanations for being dutiful stenographers of the U.S. empire and its wars? So this narrative didn't stick. And so they had to do something to throw a wrench in it. And so they used this other anchor, Liz Wall, to basically try to paint me as Ill illegitimate, a Putin puppet, and paint her as the real dissident. And, and once this other story came out, it, it really, it was too late. You know, that phrase, like the truth circles around the world before, or the, the lie, a lie will circle around the world before the truth could put, up, put on its shoes or whatever. Like, that's really what happened here. It was like this fervor, this frenzy that within 24 hours, this was the new narrative. And no one even knew um, how dark this, this actual operation was that a neocon architect of the Iraq war actually facilitated and stage managed this PSYOP of this other anchor to try to undermine what I did and paint the network as actually illegitimate. It was fascinating. Um, and really on her interviews, I mean, you could tell that there was no real understanding of even, you know, what she was doing. She had notes with her that she was basically given by these people and she couldn't even explain what the propaganda was that she was told to say because there really was no story there. But of course it didn't matter at the end of the day, the damage was done. Wow. <laughs> so, uh, I've got, I've got uh, a lot of thoughts. Um, I mean, that's, that's so intense. And, you know, I think, I mean, I thank you for, for, for sharing that and I'm processing it. And I think that like, 
um, you know, with the limited time that I have with you, I wanted to spin that into a question that I have been asked a lot uh, here at The Real News and, and even uh, from listeners of my show, Working People, which is not a Politi- it's, it doesn't focus on geopolitics all that much at all. It focuses, again, on workers' struggles. But people are reaching out and asking about this because, especially for folks who have recognized the compromised position, I'll put it gently, of mainstream corporate media and who search for answers among independent media sources, that suspicion of psyops and and of of wolves amongst the sheep <laughs> you know like or or, or you know like they're, they're it, i feel like everyone is on very high alert and in fact it it becomes one of the weapons of first resort when people start kind of lashing out at media makers whose opinions they very much disagree with whose reporting they feel is lacking in certain points yada 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 people get immediately accused of actually being uh, a sire, right? You know, like a being a plant. And I guess the the going back to the fog of war thing, the really humbling part about it is that there's actually a lot about that that we genuinely can't know. There are people whose voices I do value, but I, I don't know them. I don't know how much I can trust them at the end of all things. So I guess I'm asking for viewers and listeners how learning from that experience that you had what sort of critical media literacy tools should we have in our toolbox to know when we're being duped or at least to to better try to discern right how to interpret you know the the voices in left and independent media to know who we can trust does that does that question make sense yeah i mean it was a very it was a really tough time for me to navigate. Let's just say that because I was the center of this media storm. We know how these cycles operate where they chew you up and spit you out. And at the end of the day, I was fully exposed for all my faults. And that's why I just continue to just wear my bias and opinion just on my sleeve, you know, love it or leave it. I don't hide who I am and I don't hide what I'm advocating for. And it's really difficult to discern the same. You know, we have a sea of of corporate media journalists who I feel like they get into the industry for the right reason, um, but there's a lot of self-censorship. There's a lot of pressure to conform. A lot of this is about access and keeping your job. I mean, that, that really is what it is. And I think a lot of people who get into the industry in these outlets like the New York Times and such go down the line, they believe in the underpin, like the myths that underpin this country. I mean, they believe in American exceptionalism, they believe in capitalism, and they believe in empire. And so it's not that they're lying, it's just that that's their belief system and it kind of fits neatly into the way that the media functions. And of course, posits itself as a free press. Um, I think that as media literate, or at least hoping to be media literate people, uh, there is a lot of pressure and work to do. A lot of people have no time to, you know, get the Chinese perspective, Russian perspective, Western perspective, and then like, the like figure out the truth for themselves. And so I think that you have to just find outlets like the real news, find journalists that have shown themselves to be true, to be consistent, and follow those journalists' work and and support those journalists' work. And just, that's really all we can do because we can't expect people to do the job that we do. And that's why we're enlisted to do this and to, to kind of navigate these fields ourselves. As you mentioned, there is a very heavy fog of war going on today. And going back to my point about Russian media, let's just pick out one story that turned out to be false. Um, where Russia, you know, invaded Snake Island and blew up those 13 soldiers that said, go F yourself, Russia. Well, I found out from Russian media a day after that, that it was completely false story that was paraded around. Zelensky said that these guys were going to get medals of honor and like the whole media used them as these heroes that stood up to Russia. Well, it turned out to be false. We would never, maybe I would never have known that that story was false if I didn't have the Russian media perspective actually validating or or coming out and countering that. And that is important to discern fact from fiction. I want to know all sides. I need to know all sides. And we're not going to really know what's going on on the ground because there's so many conflicting reports until sadly the dust is settled and the blood has been shed. And, you know, as peace, as peace loving people and as people who are pushing for accountability 
with the role that our government plays. I think that as journalists in the heart of the empire, the belly of the beast, it is our duty to focus on what we can do to advocate for change. Of course, we can join in the course of condemnation against Putin. That's easy. That takes no effort at all. But what takes a little bit more effort is actually figuring out our role, our role as citizens, our duty as journalists who live here to put pressure and to hold power to account in our own government, who's not only exacerbating tensions there, sending hundreds of millions of dollars in weaponry. We just sent anti-aircraft missiles um, there in Ukraine. There's numerous pundits and politicians calling for a no-fly zone, which would actually mean a full scale nuclear war. I'm not sure if they actually know that that's what they're calling for. And the list goes on. And so we need to de-escalate not only tensions between these two countries, but the rhetoric. We need to bring people back to reality. This is the role that NATO's cause. No, this doesn't legitimate NATO's presence. This is actually, this should show us the opposite, that all of NATO's aggression for the last 30 years brought us to the doorstep of war. It doesn't excuse anything Russia's doing, but why are we making the situation worse? Why are we sanctioning an entire country? Why are we asphyxiating tens of millions of people, punishing, collectively punishing populations that have nothing to do with what their criminal actions of their government are doing? Can you imagine if that's what the whole world came together to do for Americans in the midst of the war on terror? I mean, it's really disturbing the bloodlust and everyone's pressuring everyone to drink from the blood goblet. And we need to really be the voice of reason here because there's not many outlets left. And the pressure to conform and feed the algorithm to this sensationalist drivel is very strong because we have to operate under a capitalist model still. And that is a very difficult thing to do when you're trying to do responsible journalism. But we have to do it no matter what uh, the response is, you know, and that's that's just our duty, Max. And you're doing a great job and we're just going to do the best we can to sift through the disinformation and keep reporting what we feel like is the most thing to, to put front and center. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm truly honored and humbled by that. And I, I thank you very much for saying that, Abby, and for viewers and listeners it goes without saying but i will say it anyway that if you're not watching and supporting the empire files you need to correct that in a hurry for all the reasons that abby just said <laughs> um, you know, because um because those 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 uh war drum beating bloodthirsty uh uh, uh you know fang dripping voices are incredibly well funded they're the ones who are getting you know the the most airtime. they're the ones that can uh uh you know project their message to to every corner of the country and beyond we don't right the real news is is viewers supported we're doing our best just like every other independent media outlet is but we are very much it is very much a david and goliath uh sort of uh, a situation and what we're talking about is ultimately the potential annihilation of life on this planet i don't say that to be alarmist. I say that because one of the most prominent voices in that sort of corporate media ecosystem, this, this, if, if I may editorialize this, this dipshit Sean Hannity is literally going out there and saying, why don't we just, you know, bomb uh, this Russian convoy and not say who did it? Putin will never figure it out. This man is literally saying in, in the spread, in the span of one sentence, Sean Hannity goes, we can see in full detail through satellite images thousands of miles away, you know, this Russian convoy. Then he goes, let's bomb it and not tell Putin who it is. It's like, if you if we can see them in that clear detail, what makes you think they're not going to see who's bombing them in clear detail? Like, and 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 that is just it 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 boggles the mind. I'm 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 genuinely kind of speechless on that front, especially because when it comes to the U.S. and Russia, we are talking about two world powers that have over ninety percent of the world's nuclear weapons. Like that, we're not fucking around. I'm sorry to say, pardon my language, but we need to all recognize the actual human stakes here and and non-human stakes here, both for the people whose suffering we are seeing um, on our screens in Ukraine, the people who are fleeing, the people in Russia who are hurting from these sanctions who don't even want this war, the leftists who are trying to demonstrate against the war in Russia and who are being viciously cracked down upon, including folks that we've talked to here at The Real News. There's a lot of pain in this situation. And the fact that that 
our concern for that pain and, and the needlessness of that pain, the avoidability of that pain, that should be front and center. We shouldn't be, I, I think back to, you know, back to my academic days, Abby, when I was studying uh, Mexican politics in the 19th and 20th century, right? And I think back to these postcards that used to be sold around the U.S. showing um, American citizens on the Rio Grande sitting and watching the Revolutionary War happen, like literally making a day out of it, having picnics. I'm not saying that that's what we're doing, but that's the image that comes up for me where we are so kind of distanced from that horror, that reality, that human pain, but it still in some ways is a sort of spectacle that we feed off of. And with the time that I have remaining with you, I guess I wanted to ask you about that because people have rightly pointed out the the racist double standard with the way that the Western media has covered the war in Ukraine, right? I mean, we've seen just kind of just horrifying examples of of anchors and correspondents being like, well, this war matters because they're white. <laughs> this war matters because they look like us, sure, right? Yeah. It's really that simple. This war matters because it's in Europe. They're not brown. They don't speak a language that's unrecognizable. They don't look more like like me. And I'm just like, uh, okay, the quiet part has been said very much out loud. <laughs> and so, um, but and and when people are pushing a, back against that, it even kind of rebounds to us here at the Real News. Like when we cover the war in Ukraine, people say, "Well, why aren't you covering the wars elsewhere?" It's like, "Well, well, we've been doing that. We've tried to do that. We we can't cover everything, but we have a lot of great coverage, including some that you have done. Um, you know, on the horror unleashed upon Palestinians, on the horror that has been unleashed for for decades, if not centuries, on the people of Afghanistan, the people in Yemen, the people in Syria, the people in Central and South America, the people all around the world who are under." the boot of oppressive forces that we all you know need to try to stop i wanted to ask you in this kind of like kind of let's get some moral clarity here and let's think about how you yourself as a media maker as a journalist as a as a peace activist i want to give people the chance to sort of take the solidarity that they're feeling with the people the suffering people of ukraine right now and expand that across the globe to feel that solidarity with their fellow human beings around the world, because then maybe we will recognize that this horror, this injustice is as unbearable as it is in Ukraine, as it is everywhere else in the world. How have you done that? How have you tried to do that? Um, or what are the obstacles in doing that as a media maker, as a documentarian, as an activist? I guess help me help me figure out how to how to get people to care I know. Uh, as much for their fellow human beings around the world as we care about Ukraine and to use that to fight to keep this world from falling apart. I feel your pain. I'm thinking that day in and day out. How can we get people to widen this consciousness and apply it everywhere and have moral consistency? And I don't think it's their fault. It, it's that we're led by what we're told and we don't know any better. And the outrage that this collective outrage that's felt, that's palpable in the wake of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, where does that come from? That comes from the media chorus and the politicians and all the corporations acting with one voice to condemn Russia. And that's okay. We need to utilize that outrage, right? We need to utilize the fact that there is anger, but use that as an instructive moment. How can we actually understand that war did not start today? That war is actually a permanent state. It's been perpetuated by the U.S. for decades and decades. Um, the war on terror has been never ending. In the same week, of course, as Real News has pointed out, and many others, in the same week that Russia invaded Ukraine, there was a U.S. bombing campaign in Somalia, Israel bombed Syria, and the Saudi Arabia, Arabia coalition that's helped and facilitated, facilitated excuse me, by the U.S. bombed Yemen. There's a genocide going on in Yemen right now. And we are internationalists. We are leftists. It is natural to be repelled by the sight of soldiers invading a sovereign nation, right? It's very natural and understandable to be angry and outraged at war crimes being taken place, bombs being dropped on civilians. War is hell. 
and people die needlessly and suffer needlessly. And that applies everywhere in the world. And you know what we can do about it? I can't do anything about Russia invading Ukraine right now. I'm an American citizen. I'm sitting here in Los Angeles. What I can do is try to pressure my government to stop unleashing the horror that it does on a daily basis that subjugates hundreds of millions of people around the world under the boot of U.S. militarism, the barbarism that's unleashed on the people of Yemen. Yes, it matters, not just because I know that they're brown and they're poor, but yes, life matters everywhere. Human life is sacred. It doesn't matter what skin color you have. It doesn't matter where you live. It's very emotional for me because I care about all human life and seeing what my government has done, the murder, the wars, the barbarism that's unleashed on the rest of the world in my name, it angers me so much. And I know that people don't know. And how dare the media, how dare the media just pick and choose what it wants people to see and care about when I know that people would care if they knew what their government was doing in their name. And that's where we come in. All we can do as people who live in the West is expose what our government is doing and help put that pressure to end this madness. I mean, I'm seeing the hypocrisy is so astounding to me that I see you know, BBC publishing an actual instructive manual on where to throw Molotov cocktails to kill Russian soldiers and tanks. Can you imagine if they did that with Palestinian freedom fighters against the Israeli occupation? Can you even imagine if there was a Molotov cocktail training course being aired live on Sky News, pro-Palestinian, trying to show people how to make Molotov cocktails? I mean, it is just so fascinating the way that this unfolds when it's a Western enemy. And that's not okay for me. I think that we need to extend our solidarity to life. And we need to understand that all life matters all around the world. And it's our duty and responsibility to try to stop the suffering and murder and end of life that's perpetrated by our governments in the West. No matter what the media tells us to do or say, that, that's our job and that's our role. And that's really all we can do. So that is the one and only Abby Martin, an American journalist, show presenter, activist, artist. Can't say enough about uh, how powerful and necessary her voice is, but if you aren't already, you should be checking out The Empire Files, an invaluable investigative documentary and interview series that Abby hosts. Please check out uh, her feature documentary, Gaza Fights for Freedom, and be on the lookout for the feature she is currently working on entitled Earth's Greatest Enemy. Abby, thank you so much for your time and for your insight and for your passion. Thank you so much, Maximilian. Really appreciate everything you do, and thanks for having me on. Keep fighting. Keep fighting. And to all of you, please keep fighting as well. This is Maximilian Alvarez for The Real News Network. Before you go, please head on over to therealnews.com forward slash support. Become a monthly sustainer of our work so we can keep bringing you important coverage and conversations just like this. Stay safe and thank you so much for watching.